again um, to uh, to to Ari and and thanks um, uh, to CSP for for hosting Hadar. We, we, we've been we've been here from the beginning. Those of you got to learn with me way back at the beginning of January, and we've been uh, making our way through certain aspects of the Sidur together. We looked at the first blessing of the Amida. Um, the second blessing about resurrection, and the last time we looked at the Kaddish, the mourners' Kaddish together. Um, and today, I really wanted to look at a different angle of what it means to pray uh, the Sidur. And, um, and and to that end, uh, my hope is that we'll we'll open up the words in a different mode. The last three sessions with me have really been looking at the links to the words in the Bible and in rabbinic literature and the ways in which those links add to our understanding and our meaning making around the words. But for a lot of people, for most people probably, the experience of going to a prayer service, a Jewish prayer service, and, and reading the words in the Siddur is less an experience of, um, of, of linking and meaning making through the connections in the words and more, you know, uh, a sort of non-cognitive uh, experience of what it means to, to pray. And part of what I'm curious about and interested to hear from you, and in a moment I'll invite this uh, in the chat, um, is, you know, what are, what are some of the non-word uh, experiences that are meaningful to you when you, when you pray uh, in, in a Jewish context? And if you think of all the categories of what the non-verbal aspects of prayer are, uh, there are many, many, you know, sort of what, what you wear and what does the room look like and how are the chairs organized? How hot or cold is it? Is it sunny or dark? Uh, there's a rule actually in the Talmud that you have to pray in a room with a window. Um, uh, you know, that's sort of a nod to the non-cognitive as aspects of what it means to pray. What is the musical experience? Uh, what's the pace? Uh, how much of it is in Hebrew versus English or, you know, or the vernacular and where you are? Um, uh, you know, how is everybody moving their bodies? Are they shuckling and shaking their bodies? Is everybody sitting still? Are we standing? Are we, um, you know, uh, shuffling side to side? Um, are people's eyes open or closed? Um, what are you doing with your hands? All these questions sort of build up a prayer environment. Uh, even if the words are exactly the same, you can have two totally different prayer experiences uh, with the same words, just based on some of the non-verbal uh, aspects of what it means to pray. And part of my, my goal here, and I love coming through the, the comments are some of your, your own experiences around some of those non-cognitive, non-verbal aspects of what's meaningful to you in, in prayer. Uh, so keep them coming. And, and part of what I want to explore with you today here is the ways in which um, this is not an accident. In other words, the, the nonverbal aspects of prayer is not an afterthought or a modern experience of prayer. It actually is something that's baked into the rabbinic thinking around prayer um, and goes hand in hand with a, a, a deep understanding of the of the words and the and the and the links that are found in those words that we've explored in the previous sessions. So for all of, all of you out there who are sort of like I don't know what the prayer book says, but I kind of like singing it. This session goes out to you because um, that is not a uh, that is not a compromised position. It's actually just another pathway in terms of understanding what the goal of Jewish prayer is and how we might experience it in a more uh, robust way. So, um, so what I'm going to do uh, today in the source sheet that Ari posted, and I'm going to share in just a moment um, uh, with all of you, is to walk through some of the discussions and the considerations um, of uh, what are some of the non-cognitive, non-verbal aspects of prayer and how we might um, connect to those uh, as well. Okay, um, I'm going to start off from, from, from the scary point of view. <laughs> Uh, the scary point of view is as follows. I'm going to share the screen in just a second, but just to prepare you for it, there are certainly some opinions in uh, our tradition which say, if you don't understand the words, you've missed the entire point. Like there's no such thing as I'm going to sing along with the melody, but I don't know what's coming out of my lips. There, that is definitely a position 
in our tradition and it sort of makes sense on its own terms. Like if you're saying words, you should understand what the words mean. What we saw in the last few sessions is it's not so easy to understand words because um, you think you understand them if you sort of translate them into English, but that doesn't mean that you understand the links or the context or the rabbinic understanding of those phrases. That takes work. Um, but I do want to look at that as a starting off point, and then we're going to move from there and diverge to the world of, okay, what if you don't understand the words at all? How are you meant to um, experience prayer uh, in a Jewish setting, and, and, and what is the thinking about that? So let me share the screen here um, so we can do this together. Um, okay, just give me a thumbs up. You can see the, the screen there. Great, thank you. Okay. So let's start off by uh, with the Rambam. This is the, what I'm calling the scary position. Uh, the Rambam, who Maimonides, who is is really, um, I would say, not a touchy feely. Uh, you, you wouldn't find him at the uh, progressive body movement, uh, you know, uh, library minion in your synagogue. Um, he says, but you know, he's he's drawing on on old sources. He says the following. He says, if, however, you pray merely by moving your lips while facing a wall, uh, and at the same time, think about your buying and selling, right? If all you're doing is like rote recitation of the prayers, but in your head, you're like, oh, I, I really got to remember to do this errand at the supermarket. And I got, you know, I left my door unlocked. I got to run and take care of that. All that's going through your head as you're reciting the words. And similarly, in all cases in which you perform a commandment, any commandment, merely with your limbs, with your body, as if you were digging a hole in the ground or hewing wood in the forest, right? Where you can just sort of space out and not pay attention. Your body's sort of going on autopilot without reflecting upon either the meaning of that action or upon God from whom the commandments proceeds or upon the end of the action, the purpose of the action, why I'm doing this action. If you ignore all that and you just do the action or say the words, then you should not think that you have achieved the end, the tachlit, the purpose. Don't think you've done anything. If all you did was wrote by rote recite the words, they are not uh, little items on a checklist to check off as you space out and do other things, okay? That's how you can brush your teeth. That's not, according to the Ramam, how you can uh, recite the words of the prayer book. So, uh, so again, this is the scary position, raising the bar high. You think you can just go and go through the motions? No. Nope. The Ramam's not giving you that out, okay? So that is one side of the ledger. But what I want to look at with you is perhaps more surprisingly, the other side of the ledger is also represented in our sources, uh, dating back, back much earlier than the Rambam, much earlier than Maimonides um, in the 12th century, and, and going back to the Talmud, where in the Talmud itself, we're going to see some examples of some rabbis who struggled with focusing and paying attention when it was time to recite the prayers. Uh, now, presumably these, these were people who had access to the meaning, did understand um, what it would mean to say the words, but nevertheless were struggling with what it means to have intention or focus when you're reciting the words. So I don't wanna make a, I, I don't want this to be a, a situation in which, well, it was sort of an ignorant population that didn't really understand Hebrew and you know, they're out of luck. But anybody who understood the, the words because they were of the educated class, they're, they're in good standing. What we're gonna see is some examples of some rabbis who didn't really under, uh, who didn't really, weren't able to bring their focus and attention even if they had the intellectual capacity to do so uh, and, 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 the, and the training and the education. So let's take a look at that um, um, here. So let's start. These are two examples from the Talmud Yerushalmi, from the Jerusalem Talmud, edited um, probably somewhere in the fourth, fifth century. So we're going back, you know, 700 years before the Rambam. We get the following statement. Rav Laya and Rav Yasa said the name of Rav Acharuba, the great Rav Acha, one who praised the Amida and finds himself at Shomea Tithila, at the blessing which ends, blessed are you God who hears prayer. That's blessing number 16 for those of you keeping score. So you're a good, you know, 16 out of the 19, you're, you're a good, you know, seven eighths of the way done with the Amida or thereabouts. And you haven't really paid attention. You just sort of pick up your head and find yourself at that 
16th bracha, it's considered as if he had intention. Okay, chazaka kivein. That is to say, I'm not sure, was I paying attention? Was I not paying attention? Was I spacing out? Was I thinking about my laundry? Was I, you know, thinking about my business? I don't remember. I wasn't paying attention. How, how was I or wasn't I focused? We assume that you were focused, okay? Which is a very generous assumption, I would say. If you weren't paying attention, then all of a sudden you wake up and there you are at the 16th blessing. You weren't even sure if I paid attention or not. We'll give you the benefit of the doubt you did pay attention. Um, and then we get the following, uh, um, you know, sort of other side of the ledger statement. Rabbi Yirmiya says the name Rabbi Yazar. One who prayed and didn't have intention, if you didn't have focus when you said the Amida, if he knows that he can return and have intention, if he knows he can go back and do it better, he should, you, yeah, do it better. But if not, if you don't have intention, if you know you're just not going to have the focus, you shouldn't pray at all, right? So there's actually a pathway in which you're exempt from prayer, exempt from the Amida, if you don't think you can achieve that level of intention, uh, which is a very interesting position. That is to say, um, we're, we're sort of dealing with humans as they are. If you don't think you can do it, um, then we're not gonna we're not gonna force you to do it. Um, now, if we took that really seriously, we might lead to probably the situation we find ourselves here in America of nobody would ever pray because they would say, "Well, I'm not really gonna get to have intention, so let me just stop praying altogether." So they don't take that really and run with it all the way. In fact, in the Middle Ages, people say, you know, back in the olden days in the Talmud, people had the ability to have intention and focus. Nowadays, no one can do that. So if no one can do it, then we must just like sort of say the words anyways, even though we can't get to the level that they were at, as opposed to giving up on the project of prayer. But uh, we see even in the Talmud times, people struggled with this. I, I love, I love this because they give you actual examples of rabbis spacing out. You remember way, way back at the beginning of January, we did some rabbis who had some questions about igno you know, ignorance. They, 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 one rabbi couldn't lead the Shema, couldn't lead the Amida. How was he considered a rabbi? Here we get rabbis struggling with having focus or intention around the words. So let's just take a look at, at this. Rabbi Chia Rabbah said, I never had intention in my entire life. I never had focus. I never had the ability to concentrate during the Amida. Never did it. He said, once I tried to have intention, one time I was like, I'm really going to do it this time. I'm really going to focus on the words and their meaning. And instead, I thought in my heart and said, who will enter before the king first, the tax collector or the exilarch? The exilarch was like the leader of the Jewish people on a political level. Um, so he like starts to space out and think about random questions of etiquette in terms of who approaches the king. Um, you know, is it, the, is it the minister of the finances or is it the, 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 the minister of, of, of politics? This has nothing to do with the Amida. And he was like, let me share with you my struggles with having focus and intention. I could never do it. I tried once and I didn't get very far. Then we get some other confessions of rabbis who space out during davening. Shmuel, who was a major, major leader of the Jewish community in, in Babylonia, says, Shmuel said, I count clouds <laughs> or bricks, depends on you. You understand that that term in the Yerushalmi. So he's like looking at, he's like scared. Remember, they don't have, they don't have books because it's an oral culture. So he's not holding anything in his hands. He's looking ahead and he's like, oh, look at that. I'm just counting three, four, five. Rabbi Bone said, I count bricks. Okay. I'm looking at on the wall and counting bricks. Rabbi Matana said, I accord thanks to my head that when I arrive at Modim, which is the second to last bracha of the Amida, it, it bows of its own accord, meaning my head is operating on autopilot, right? You're supposed to bow at the beginning of the Amida and at the almost end of the Amida, at the second to last blessing. And Rabbi Bone says, Rabbi Matana says, I just do that on, on, on autopilot by itself, okay? So these are rabbis who were struggling to achieve any level of focus or intention, and it didn't have to do with their intellectual capabilities or capacity. on the change of prayer itself, which is to say, even for the best of us, even if we went through the entire Sidor, me and you went through it all together, 
you know, we spent a year doing it. Um, when it comes time to praying, we might not be able to have the focus and attention that we would ideally want in order to recite the prayer. And at that point, you can go in two directions. You can say, great, if you don't have the intention, don't pray, just give up on that whole project. It's only meaningful if you have the intention. If you don't have it, forget it. Or you do what you know a good tr Jewish tradition apparently was, which is to say, I space out when I daven sometimes. It's just part of what it means to, uh, you know, to have this experience. Um, okay, so that doesn't necessarily exhaust all the possibilities of what happens in prayer. I'm just trying to give permission. If you ever found yourself spacing out during prayer, I'm telling you, you're in good company. <laughs> And it's not necessarily uh, like a failure of the 21st century or of our American Jewish educational system or any other numbers of external factors. It's a, it's a part of what it means to be human is that you don't always have that level of intention and focus. Now, we go another level here, another step, which, which I want to explore, which is not to say that spacing out is, you know, eh. I wish I could have focus. I don't have focus, but at least I'm not alone. And these other great rabbis also were with me in that struggle. But what if actually the spacing out, what we would call spacing out during the words was itself a way of achieving some level of connection in prayer that goes in a different path than understanding all the words, okay? In other words, Let's just say I recite the words. Is there any intrinsic value to that? That's not a second order level of, ah, I wish I could have attention. I can't, but at least I, I checked it off the, the, the list of what I'm supposed to do. What if, what if there's some actual value in reciting words without having an intellectual experience with, with the words? And again, I'm cutting against what I've been teaching in the last three sessions. And you know that I'm not advocating this as the only pathway, but I do want to explore it because for so many of us, this is a real experience. What if saying the words isn't just um, like a compromise, uh, but it's actually an achievement and I get somewhere spiritually by giving voice to words that I'm not necessarily thinking about on their meaning level. Um, so let's, let's see how some of that plays out in our in our sources here, and, I, and I'm appreciating the comments as they're coming in and, you, and the dialogues that are happening in the chat as well. Um, okay, so let me reshare the screen here and, and we'll take a look at some of this here. Um, okay, this I found to be an amazing close read of one of the lines of the Siddur that if you take it seriously, it actually gives you permission to have a spiritual experience with the words without understanding the words. Um, and, 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 and so I want to look at it with you. So we say in the Amida, Shema Koleinu Adonai Eloheinu. Um, listen to our voice, Lord our God. And you may know that from the weekday Amida, num blessing number 16. You may know it from uh, Yom Kippur, right? That's a high point that we say during the Slichot services on Yom Kippur, um, where the ark is open, Shema Koleinu, hear our voice. Now, if you read that carefully and you understand what those two words mean, it means asking God to listen to the call, to the voice, to the sound, as opposed to by the end of that blessing, you're going to say, blessed are you, God, who hears tefillah, shomea tefillah, who hears prayer. So the careful reader is going to ask, what does it mean for God to listen to the voice, to the sound, as opposed to God listens to the prayer? Uh, and and these, these commentators from the, uh, from the 16th century are going to sort of play this out a little bit. Um, Moshe Bar Yosef Mitrani in, in, uh, in Italy. Okay, so he says the following. He says, even if we haven't had intention, even if we haven't had that kavana as is fitting in our prayers, even if we haven't had the meaning making around the, the words themselves, we're asking that God should hear the kol, the voice or the sound of our prayers even if that sound is without intention. And in the end of that blessing, he goes on and says, Ki tefilat kol pet, because you, God, are the God who listens to the prayer of all mouth, of all mouths. Actually, in Ashkenaz, they don't say this. Um, 
in Ashkenaz, the Tfilat Amcha, uh, the prayer of your nation. But in the in Nusach Sfard and older versions of this blessing, uh, I say, God listens to the, the, the prayer of all mouth, of all pet, of all the, the mouths out there. And now he's going to read this carefully and say, it's a, a brilliant move. Even the prayer that is said from the lips and outward, meaning the tefillah of the peh, the, the prayer of the mouth, as opposed to the prayer of the heart, the prayer of the intention, the prayer of the, of the mind, the prayer of the understanding, even if it's just the prayer of your lips and outward, your lips and beyond, which is not with intention, it's not talking about your, your brain or your heart, God should hear it through God's great mercy. Okay, that's what we want God to, to accept. Um, since God hears the voice of the prayer, even without intention, that is how all flesh comes to you. Okay, in other words, God can listen to sound that you didn't put intention behind, and there's some value to that. And that's why we're talking about a call, shomea call, God listening to the sound, and not just shomea tefillah, not just listening to the prayer. In other words, this is not just an expert um, activity for those who can really focus on the words. It's also about making sound. Sound itself is valuable. Um, and, uh, you know, other religions have really taken this and ran with it, right? You know, you could sit and services would be a lot shorter if all you did was say om and repeat that. And then you can go have kiddish. Okay, so you could really go deep on the side, the side of sound as the way we want to engage with this. We didn't choose to do that. All the words of our prayers actually have syntactical meaning. But there is this strand that's looking at the creation of the sound as ipso facto valuable. And God is listening to that sound and not just listening to words that are infused with meaning that we understand. And I find that to be sort of very, very significant um, in, in, in the world that we, we, we live in here. Now, for those of you who, who say, oh, gosh, I really liked the way that you learned um, the prayers in the previous three sessions. And I would like to do that. I'd like to have that focus and intention. I just need everybody to daven a lot slower, <laughs> right? If I'm going to focus and pay attention and think about all the connections and the meanings of each of the phrases, I can do it, but we're going way too fast for us to, to really engage in that project and that exercise. So this is where the, the next source is, is sort of speaking uh, directly to that. Uh, you know, they once did a study of, um, of Orthodox uh, minyanim, of Orthodox prayer groups. This is going back into the 70s. And they, what they discovered was that Orthodox prayer services, daily prayer services that go super fast, right? The spiritual attainment of the people in that service was similar to the state of mind that people who engage in transcendental meditation experience. That is a different project then going through the words of the Siddur, which you know I love and I care about, and understanding them for meaning, but there's something about the speed, which is actually its own value. So if you've ever been in prayer and said, you know, in a prayer service and said, like, I don't know how anybody is saying these words so fast. How can anyone keep up? I'm being, you know, I'm really trying here. And you guys are just going way too fast. Um, what I'm here to tell you is, first of all, a lot of people have that experience, but also there is some value to saying the words fast if you're looking from a lens of sort of divine connection that is non-cognitive. So the goal is not only, ah, I need to understand all the words, so could you please slow it down? You might want to do that sometimes, but if you find yourself in a place where everybody's going really fast, that is its own value. That's its own, um, its own spiritual path. Um, so let me reshare the screen so we can look at some of this together. Um, uh, this is, uh, is, is from a, a modern source uh, from, from 1995. In his essay, I'm not going to pronounce the, the, the French correctly, Paul Valéry observed that it is only the speed with which we pass over words 
that allows us to understand them at all. Pause long enough upon even the simplest word, consider its etymology, for instance, and it changes into an enigma, an abyss, a torment to thought. Okay, so this is the idea in which, you know, you'll be, you you have this experience, I'm sure, where you, you say a word and then you're like, that's a funny word, you know, and, and say any word over and over again. You're sort of like, that, that's some strange word. But if we actually just speak at a, you know, and I'm from New York now, so it's like, I'm speaking faster than your average bear. Um, part of that is, yeah, you say words fast because you're trying to achieve something other than a deep dive into every single word and its etymology and links and connections. I believe in that. That's what I care about. And we did some of that in the last three sessions, but I'm also saying there's a value to going fast as well. Um, okay, that's, that's sort of, um, you know, looking at this idea of the speed of any given text as having its own value, the sound of any given text as having its own value. I wanna push one step further on this, um, which is to say, this is not just an after the fact creation or situation that we find ourselves in, but the author of the prayer surely must have intended us to have a meaningful interaction with the words. And we are just choosing to experience the sounds and not the intended meaning. That is true about a lot of prayers in which I believe there's a poetic uh, uh, approach and, and the way in which I'm uh, constructing those prayers is deep and you know, intertextual and all those wonderful things that we looked at in the last few sessions. Um, but there actually were some prayers I want to uh, introduce us to in which the purpose of the prayer itself, the writing of the author itself was intended to push us past the syntactical meaning of those words. Uh, and, and, and the person who gives great expression to this is uh, the modern scholar of, of liturgy, Ari, you said, you know, where could I do a PhD in, in liturgy? This is probably the last place you could do it right now is with Larry Hoffman at HUC, um, Hebrew Union College, um, taught there for uh, about four decades, actually just recently retired. Um, and he wrote a wonderful book in the late 80s called Beyond the Text. Um, where he is, and it's one of those great titles where you can get the, the main point of the book just from the title. The text of prayer is not the limit of the experience of prayer. There's, a, there's an element that goes beyond the text. Um, and his final chapter in that book is examining some of the mystical prayers in our prayer book. Again, this is not every prayer. It's not even the majority of prayers in our prayer book, but it is some highlight prayers in our prayer book that are intentionally mystical texts the goal of a mystical prayer, I'm, I'm sort of uh, delineating here, not as praising God or asking God for something, but rather mystics want to connect to God. Mystics are yearning for God and longing for God and want to deepen that, um, that connection with God as opposed to a specific request or a particular praise. Um, and so if you're a mystic, and you're composing a prayer, you might use words to achieve something other than meaning through interpretation or even translation. So let me, I'll just read to you what uh, his formulation of this idea, and then we'll look at a couple of examples, some of which will be very familiar to you. Um, okay, so Hoffman says, I'm in part two, if those of you who are following along at home, we're on top of page four. Words in prayer, were not always intended to convey information about reality. The very reverse was often the goal. The mind was to be freed from the normal strictures of thought so that in the extreme instance, a trance might set in, right? The, the goal of the words is to induce a trance. I don't have to explain this to California. Okay. We deal with a form of mantra. True, these mantras are not strings of totally meaningless syllables, om, but they are mantras nevertheless, in that otherwise meaningful words are used in meaningless ways. That is, the sentences they constitute do follow the normal rules of syntax and thus are translatable into conceptually valid statements, right? I have a sense making, I can translate this 
sentence into English, but their function is irrelevant to their message and their cognitive content is not allowed to intrude upon their rhythmic affective function. The purpose of the words is to be rhythmic and affective as opposed to um, deliver a, uh, a set of meaning statements or a dogma. Now, we went through this last week with Kaddish, where I was taking us on a meaning, meaning interpretation and a linked journey to words. But you know, you know as well as I do, that part of the power of Kaddish, you don't need a, a class in interpretation around it, it's the sound of those words, right? Yit barach, yit shtabach, yit par, yit ramam, yit nasei, yit nasei. There's a meter. And even if you can't translate all of those words, and even if you do, and you have to like run to the thesaurus to say like, well, how do you say praise eight different ways? Extol, exalt. Tell me the difference between extol and exalt. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the purpose is not to... Um, give synonyms for praise, the purpose is to take you on a mental, non-cognitive journey of connection that comes through the sound of the words. The greatest example around the Kaddish is in 19th century Germany, one of the, one of the, the moves of the reformers um, uh, was to say, hey, nobody understands Aramaic. So let's translate this prayer into German. And then if the whole purpose was to be in the vernacular, which we saw last week, it wasn't really the purpose of Aramaic, it was really the language of the Beit Midrash, the language of the study house. But let's say they thought it was about the vernacular, so let's put it in the modern vernacular. That's German, that's not Aramaic. So they translated the Kaddish into German. And you know what happened? People hated it because it didn't have any of those rhythmic elements that are part of the Aramaic onslaught of synonyms. Ba, 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 ba. It didn't come out that way in German. And that's true about English as well. Um, so you're kind of missing the point if you translate a mystical prayer into the vernacular, into English or German, if the whole point of the prayer was to take you on a non-cognitive journey that is driven by the sound and the pace of the pronunciation of the words as opposed to the meaning and the connections that lie underneath the words. I'll give you a couple other examples of this that, um, that Hoffman uh, points to in this chapter. So this is probably less well known, but in the daily service around the, 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 the recitation of the Shema, one of the central parts of Jewish prayer, um, we have a blessing that talks about God as creator of light. And in the middle of that blessing, we all of a sudden get a, a vision of what it means for angels to praise God. Now listen to the this phrase in the Hebrew, and then I'm going to read it to you in the English. Um, I'm in the box here on, on page four. Listen to it in the Hebrew, even if you don't, especially if you don't understand it. Now, what do you hear in the sounds of those words? Right? You hear, and you can see it if you can read Hebrew letters. You see the mm, the mem, and the ma, 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 ma. Now let's do it in the English. The king, exalted alone since then, praised, glorified, and elevated since the world began. Okay, I mean, sure, if you say so. Uh, like, that's a nice description and maybe a praise of God, but it doesn't sound anything like the Hebrew. The Hebrew is going through and uh, it's taking you on a journey of mm. And indeed, this is something that um, angels, uh, you know, you know what angels do. <laughs> I mean, angels show up on earth and, you know, guide people and inform people they're messengers in that way. But what are they doing mainly? Mainly, they're up in heaven praising God. That's what angels do. They sing. And you know how angels sing? Well, they basically sing in two forms. One is the way we sing. They open their mouths and they say, ah, they sing out their mouth. And the other way they sing is that they, the main difference between us and angels, they have wings. So you know what, what happens when you flap your wings? Have you ever been in a, like you walk through a, like a crowd of pigeons and they all fly away? It's this great noise. It's this rash gadol. It's this loud um, flapping, you know, that has some sort of mm, quality to it. And that might be, I'm not saying this is what it is 100%, but that might be 
what the sound of the mem is trying to achieve. It's trying to take you on a cognitive, no, sorry, non-cognitive um, journey up to heaven in which you get to listen to the angels sing. Now, if the whole point of prayer is to communicate um, sentences and meaning, then a sentence like this actually is kind of useless. And indeed, one of the great fathers of, of uh, liturgy scholarship, Ismar Elbogen, a good German reformer, uh, turn of the 20th century, um, comments on this phrase. He said, it adds nothing new to the ideas that were meant to be expressed. It's merely an artificial expansion that might be deleted without loss to the content. And he later calls it an unnecessarily wordy transition. That's totally true. If you're looking at the Sidur as uh, entirely delivering sentences um, that make meaning sense, then yeah, you want to like cut it down a little bit because this doesn't really add that much more to our project. Sure. But if the goal is to create certain sounds that take you somewhere, that would be like saying, well, let's just skip the ohm part and get to the transcendental you know, experience. Like, no, the ohm takes you there. You can't cut the ohm, even if it doesn't mean anything. Um, and that's part of what this, um, this sentence might be doing. And if you miss the goal of what the purpose of these sentences are, then you're just missing the category of what we're dealing with here in the Sidur. Now, I'm not saying that everything is like this in the Sidur, don't be fooled. Um, but there are, below, there are certain prayers that were written with this mystical goal in mind. Let me give you um, one of my favorite examples here. I'm scrolling down to the bottom of page five. This is something that we may all be familiar with if you ever went to services on Friday night. I'll read it to you in the, in the Hebrew and then in the English. Lecha dodi likrat kala, penei Shabbat mikabala. Okay, now what's great about lecha dodi likrat kala, penei Shabbat mikabala, let's look at it in, in the English. Come my beloved, my dod, to greet the bride, my, the kala. Let us welcome the presence of Shabbat. Great. Sounds nice. Actually, there were some stories in the Talmud of certain rabbis walking out in the field and greeting Shabbat on Friday evening. Okay, that sounds like a great activity. Um, now, there, in other words, it is communicating something. There is an image that is conjured up by understanding the words. But and this is taking it even one step further. If the previous example was the sound of the words take you to a non-cognitive mystical place, ideally, and that's why they were written in that way. What about something like Lecha Dodi, which does have a meter. That's why we like to sing it. It's very easy to put to a melody. It was written to be sung. Um, but Take a look at what the Chadodi is doing beyond the meter and the sound and beyond the meaning. There's another level of the Sidur itself, which is the words, the, 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 the numbers associated with the words. Take a look at it. Now, this is, I, 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 again, I didn't write any of these prayers, so you can't blame me. But we know that the Chadodi was written by a Kabbalist in Sfat in the 16th century. If you're a Kabbalist and you're writing a prayer, might you have some mystical understanding of the prayer that you're writing? Probably. I mean, it would be, I would basically say, it's upon you to prove that there is no mysticism if you're a Kabbalist writing a prayer as opposed to uh, that you have to prove to me there is mysticism. Well, let's take a look at it for a second. In the English, how many words are there? Come, my beloved to greet the bride, let us welcome the presence of Shabbat. That was 14 words. How about in the, in the Hebrew? Actually, it's kind of nice, it's 14. In the Hebrew, lecha dodi likrat kala penei Shabbat mekabela, seven words. Do I like the number seven? I'm a Kabbalist. Yeah, I like the number seven. I like the number seven because it's the seventh day, Shabbat. You know, time is organized uh, by the sun and the moon. So like months are obvious to people and years are obvious to people, but weeks are not obvious to people. Like a seven day week is not an obvious decision. 
the Romans had a 10 day week. Um, so seven is a significant mystical number in terms of we're on the seventh day. Also, if you're a Kabbalist, and this gets a little Kabbalist technical, but you know, Madonna helped popularize this. So in the Kabbalists had Sphirot, they had 10 emanations of God. There were three upper emanations that no one has access to. And then there's seven lower emanations. So this is perhaps also mapped onto the seven Sphirot, the seven lower emanations of God. Okay, that's the words. That's not bad. How about the letters? How many letters are there in Lechado di Likrat Kala, Penei Shabbat Nekabala? I won't make you count them, but take it on authority. If you count the letters in line one, there are 15 letters. If you count the letters in line two, there are 11 letters. Okay? What is 15 and 11? If you add up 15 and 11, you get 26. 26 is the numerical value. Every Hebrew letter has a value in numbers. Is the numerical value of yud Hey vav Hey, God's most holy name. The numerical value of yud Hey vav Hey. yud is 10. Hey is 5. That's 15, i.e. line 1. Vav is 6 and Hey is 5. That's 11, i.e. line 2. And what you are doing when you recite lechado dili kret kalap and eshabat nekabalah is you are spelling out the numerical value of God's name. And not only that, the yud Hey, the 15, line one, is being united with the vav Hey, the 11 of line two. And you are in that way acting out exactly what L'chad Odi is telling you that you're doing. What's the first verse of L'chad Odi? Shamor v'zachor b'dibor echad ishmianu el amyuchad, the united God told us this. Adonai Echad, God is one, Ushemo Echad, and God's name is one, right? What I'm doing when I say the words, whether I know it or not, what I'm doing when I say the words, L'chad Udili Krakala, 15, Penei Shabbat Nekabala, 11, is I am uniting the elements of God's unity into one whole, Adonai Echad. The poem is guiding me through that process. Okay, now, we might say, gosh, I like L'chad Odi not because I'm a Kabbalist and a mystic and I'm going through the letter counting and I'm, you know, engaged in some, you know, mystical union of God. I just like the, the melody. I like the song. That's fine, too. But I'm telling you, there's other layers to understanding what's going on in these prayers that might be evident from at, at first blush. OK, so what have we seen so far? We've seen that there are some sticklers like the Rambam who say you got to have focus and intention for the meaning of the words. If you're just thinking about your laundry, you missed it. But there are others who say, no, actually creating the sound of the words is its own value. God listens to sound. And that has some mystical possibility. And then we went beyond the, um, the sound that you could have meaning for, but you didn't get there, to sound that was intended for you to just say it as a sound. Like Yitbarach, Yishtabach, Yitpar, like Hamelech, Hamramam, Levado, Meaz, Meshubach, Mephoar, Mimot Olam, all the mum sounds. So that sounds for its own purpose. The main goal of the prayer is to create a sound experience. And then there's something even farther on the chain, which is words and letters have their own esoteric meaning that you may or may not be connecting to, but the Kabbalist who wrote it definitely was thinking about the mystical uh, numerical value of the words in the Sidur. Okay, so all this is to say that the project of prayer is not limited to the understanding in a meaning sense of the words of prayer. That is an important and critical aspect, but it is not the only aspect. And there are other ways of having connection to prayer that are not necessarily second fiddle or also rands to the meaning making of the words, but the perhaps primary importance of what it means to have a Jewish prayer uh, experience. Okay, I wanna look at just a couple other examples with you before we, uh, we get to Ari's Q and A. Um, so let me just share the screen uh, one more time here. Um, this is one of my favorites which is the focus on sound volume, okay? You've all been there. There, is, there are certain congregations that you go to pray in 
in which whatever, pick your prayer, whatever prayer you want, whether it's Aleinu, Lechadodi, the Amida, whatever it is, uh, Shema Koleinu on Yom Kippur, where either you're going to have an experience where the prayer leader, the cantor, is the one who is reciting the prayer, and we are all meant to listen to their beautiful voice. Maybe it's, it's Ari's uh, partner who's leading us in prayer and sounds awesome. And that is what it means to sit in that congregation and have a prayerful experience. And there are other congregations in which the purpose of being there is not primarily as a listening experience, but as a participatory experience. Those are different sound experiences. Um, okay, and that, that, that is to say the same words recited in different levels of volume have different prayer experiences that are created. So I want to just introduce you to one last scholar here, Uri Ehrlich, who is a, a professor at Ben-Gurion University in, in the Negev, um, who writes a book called The Nonverbal Language of Prayer, where he goes through the Amida and looks at all the elements of the Amida, the standing prayer, that are not related to the words and their meaning including things like how you place your feet, how you hold your hands, where you look with your eyes, whether or not you're bowing or prostrating or standing up straight, um, whether you wash your feet, all these aspects he analyzes, including how loud do you say the prayer? And the Amida, of course, is unusual in that it is recited silently. Um, that is a non-normal mood of reciting prayer. Most prayer is recited out loud, especially in a world in which there's no uh, books where you could read to yourself from. The only way in which you knew anything was happening is if someone was saying something out loud. Um, so let's take a look for a second at how this uh, gets moves through time. So Ehrlich just points out, which I think we sort of intuit, shifts in intonation, stress, rhythm, or volume alter meaning. In addition, emotions such as joy, anger, or hatred can find expression through vocal means, even if the feeling in question has no outlet in verbal content, right? If I say a sentence with a certain set of expressions, the words may or may not be um, connected to those expressions. It's all about my intonation and volume. The expressive vocal system is at the worshiper's disposal, a tool for conveying meaning, not just through the words of prayer, when recited by rote versus with intense concentration or by a worshiper driven by urgent need versus by contentment with his lot, the same prayer sounds different. Okay, so prayers can sound different depending on how you use volume, stress, and intonation. Now, what's great about this is there actually were rules about this. How loud is everyone supposed to be in synagogue? Now, some of these rules were actually written down in the 19th century in Germany um, as an example of what a good reform congregation should sound like in Germany at that time. And uh, was published in a book called Prayer Book Reform in Europe. Jacob Petachowski is the, is the author and he, he, another uh, HUC giant. Um, he says as follows, he's quoting these rules from the early 19th century. Listen to it and tell me if it sounds like your synagogue. The members of the congregations are reminded in order to follow the cantor's prayers quietly and silently. They must refrain from the illegal and cacophonous shouting, which so frequently disturbs peaceful and true devotion. Or in another one that, uh, that comes from a little bit later in the same location, the congregation must listen silently to the prayers recited by the cantor. By no means must they audibly pray together with him, let alone sing with him, right? You don't go to the opera and sing along with the star. That's not how it works. You're not allowed to do that. But they're clearly reacting to a scenario in which people were singing along. They were having some illegal and cacophonous shouting, which you might associate with a certain more, uh, you know, I don't know, stiebel type of davening. Now, I'll give you the opposite of this. Um, which was a story told to me by a Karliner Hasid. Maybe with this we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, a Karli, the Karliner Hasidim, which is amazing, um, uh, uh, has an amazing story. It was basically almost entirely annihilated in the Holocaust. 
but the few survivors made it to, to Israel and now they have rebuilt themselves into a very, very strong um, community. They are known for screaming in prayer. Like they read the, the prayer book, they don't daven it, they don't mumble it, they don't sing it, they just scream it. And I went there to listen to them. I actually went there for Rosh Hashanah one year in Mashar and it was crazy. Seven hours of screaming the machzer. Nothing like it. So this is a story that one of the Hasidim told me. Uh, number three here. It's a great Hasidic story. It has all the elements. A misnagid, that's to say, somebody who's not Hasidic, a, a, a non-believer in the Hasidic project, went to the Karlina Rebbe and asked him, why do you scream when you pray? The Rebbe took a pen and jabbed it into the misnagid's hand. The misnagid let out a scream. When you are in pain, you scream, said the Rebbe. Now, what I love about that story is, first of all, the misnagid gets jabbed with a pen. That's totally what the Hasidic stories are about. Um, but also, there's something true about having a, a davening, a prayer experience in which your true emotions come to the fore. In other words, where prayer is not, and the synagogue is not a place where you bury your emotions, you listen silently and obediently to the cantor, uh, but you are giving voice and expression to the pain that you're experiencing. And that's something that you're going to um, give, give voice to. Um, so these are uh, two ends of a very long spectrum, right? In which on the one hand, you can't say anything and don't sing along, let's just all listen. And on the other end, we're all gonna scream as loud as we can, as if we're being jabbed uh, you know, in the hand with a pen because that's how we feel. And prayer is a place for us to give voice to our, literally give voice to our feelings. So all this is to say that there's a lot of angles to look at in, in Jewish prayer that get to what it means to have an intense and powerful experience uh, of, of praying. Some of it is the stuff we worked on in the last uh, in the last three sessions of understanding where the words come from, going deeper in that intellectual and, and meaning making project. And some of it is about understanding that sometimes prayer was meant to be non-cognitive. And there are pathways for those of us who want to have the music or the rhythm or the volume or the sound of the words uh, just wash over us and give us some experience of something divine. So uh, maybe I'll pause here and let Ari jump in. Thank you. Um, terrific session today. And um, um, so a few notes. Number one is um, when we were in Israel a few years ago on our second of our, tr uh, our trips, we met with Sh Rabbi Sharon Shalom, who is an Ethiopian rabbi. I think he's the only Ethiopian rabbi in Israel. Orthodox Ethiopian rabbi. And he said that people come to a synagogue and they would make fun of the way that the Ethiopians would daven because they daven with their hands like this. And he said, well, I go to your synagogues and you all do this and you look like you have medical issues. So I think that's another example of a completely different way to pray. And I thought that was a great example. Second is- uh, If you look further on in the source sheet, which we won't do together, but there's a whole section on what, how do you hold your hands in prayer, especially in a world in which you weren't holding a book. Right. And you could hope like in the Bible, people held their hands up like this. You know, think about Moses, Moses praying at the battle of, of Amalek and his hands were up so long they had to be supported. But that's because this this is how you showed up to pray with your hands. That's a totally different experience than this. So I'm hoping when we go to Israel in the future, we'll actually go to a service with some Ethiopians to experience their davening. Just fascinating. Number two is I grew up in the Orthodox world and I just cannot pray in English. So. What you said kind of resonated, um, and you know, at least in, in many ways, you explained why I can't do it. And I am used to the rhythms of the Hebrew words. I don't always pay attention, but I know them. They're in my head. I'm used to the words, the rhythms, the cadence, um, and that's the way I do. And the third is there's a big fight going on in our chat as to what is the most meaningful way to pray. And I think the answer is um, they're all meaningful, <laughs> and and maybe you should fight. Well, you, you're you're goal in life, I mean, you should expose yourself to different types of prayer services, but find the one that, that fits what you want. So if you want to pray slowly, find a service that doesn't say as many prayers and praise it, you know, prayer, praise slowly. Um, if you want to pray in the cadence of the Orthodox cell, go there. Um, and that, I don't think one necessarily is better than the other. And we should uh, kind of focus on ourselves and not, someone, not complain. If we're in a service that we're complaining about, go find a different service. So 
Right. I appreciated this. Uh, this uh, the Jewish program. people, thank God, has had a long track record of breakaway minyanim that were set up on definitely even less less meaningful things than the style of prayer. And uh, for sure, that's part of what drives people to set up their own their own shop. I guess I would just add to you, Ari, in, in a world in which we are all in our own silos, I, lo I love the possibility of going to a place that you would never think about like hanging out, you know, in any long-term way, but just to see something totally different um, and not to close us off to the possibility of other Jews and the way they, they daven, like you said, with the Ethiopian. I, I agree as well. And sometimes you go to a place and you'll pick up something that you'll bring back to your minion. And sometimes you'll go and you'll say, ah, that's why I do not daven at a place like this. So um, anyway, it was a terrific program. One of the questions I wanted you to follow up on was kind of the proliferation of independent minyanim and what you see if it's still, I mean, you started Kilat Hadar, um, and I assume you started because you wanted a different period of experience. You weren't getting it other places. So why did you start Kila Hadar? What is going on with these independent minyanim? Are they still happening now? And what, what are people looking for in these minyanim in, with regard to what we were talking about, the type of prayers? Well, I think a lot of the motivation around starting independent minyanim uh, was around the prayer experience. Um, and I think people were looking for a more participatory, more musical, um, you know, uh, less, less um, curated and more natural flow of a service. And right now, you know, you're looking at colleges and, and other places uh, where Jews are moving, especially young Jews are moving. There's about 80 to 100 independent minyanim that are operating by our count in, in the United States. And I think if you polled them, most of them are founded around this question of how could I have a more intense and meaningful uh, prayer experience. And for most American Jews, independent minyanim are not going to be the place where they want to be. They want to have an experience that most synagogues with cantors and professional clergy are giving them. But for some folks who, who do want uh, something that's more participatory and, and lay-led, um, you know, in a, in a quality way, that might be something that is driving that that creation. You know, one of the challenges I see, I see in our synagogue and I assume in others is the focus now on time. It's not the quality of the prayer. It's the, hey, you know, you have one hour or less for a couple for Friday night services and we're not going to give you more than two hours for Saturday morning. Again, you have to pray in a place that fits what you want and your needs. But it seems interesting that in, certainly here in our country, time is seems to be more important than prayer or uh, and I don't know if you're seeing that as well, but yeah, well, well if you, if you, I'm sure all, many of us have the experience of speaking to our non-Jewish colleagues and telling them, oh, we had a really short service and it was only two hours and their eyes bug out, you know, like, what do you mean? You were in services for two hours and that was short. Um, so I think there, you know, there is some, some premium on time and efficiency. I think, you know, at its core, the Jewish prayer service actually could be a lot shorter than its American, um, you know, synagogue version is experienced. And, uh, you know, in some ways, that's, that's also part of what the independent media, I think we're grasping at. We had this rule at Kilat Adar, no sermon longer than five minutes. Um, so no, nobody ever said, ah, oh, the rabbi was great, but I wish they would, have, they would have spoken longer. I haven't heard that yet. So could you, you know, could you shorten it in ways that still keep it meaningful? Are there, um, and we'll finish up maybe with some recommendations. If, if, if people were interested in seeing totally different types of davening, do you have three different services? Anywhere, you can choose anywhere in the world, anywhere in America that people should know about. Some of them they could probably see online, but what do right. you recommend? So a lot now is online, and, and in that way, you probably are aware of, you know, Central Synagogue and Park Avenue Synagogue. These are e-car. These are blockbuster, um, you know, online experiences. For me, I still feel like the, the in-person davening is just a whole other order of magnitude different. And I would say, you know, the I love that you took a trip to Israel. I would say basically walking into any um, Israel uh, synagogue that was not started by people from America is an experience that I would recommend. There's so many um, traditions and geographic, um, uh, you know, options, um, you know, still from the people who are from those countries, from Tunisia and Yemen and Italy and, and, and all over that you can experience. So I would say you walk around early morning Jerusalem on a Shabbat, you walk into three random places where you hear some voices as you're walking down the street, you're going to do, you're going to do really well. And I would also say that, you know, Maya Sharim sounds scary. Um, and obviously there's a gender bias there for, for, for visitors that is hard to overcome. But I have found that you can walk into those spaces 
and they're just a whole other world that's worth if you can if you can get in just experiencing you know you're belittling your own uh hometown or home area of new york city because there are so many minyanim on a friday night and a saturday morning to experience so it's a, a there's probably no other place like it in the United States, I have to say, with chagrin, given that I grew up in Boston and we are not big fans of New York, but I've grown to appreciate New York. Um, and on our trips to New York, we always went to different Friday night services and tried to pick ones that were just more interesting, unusual, different, certainly different than we would uh, pray here um, at home. So New York has many such services and people are now um, putting into the chat their favorite synagogue. So that's great. Uh, and um, I'm hoping people will take this opportunity to go and explore when, when it's safe. Online, you can definitely do, but when it's safe, go in person and maybe check out some Sephardi minions as well, uh, Mizrahi minions. So with that, I wanted to thank you for a terrific four-part series on uh, taking us into the prayer uh, from the actual prayer themselves to uh, cognitive, non-cognitive aspects of prayer. We hope you'll kind of, you'll come back. I have lots of people that want you to come back and teach once in a while um, for us. Maybe we can take our way through a door and choose some subjects. And that way, when people do daven, they can enjoy both cognitive, non-cognitive and cognitive. They actually understand maybe some of the complexities. I know now they're going to be looking at their door very differently and trying to think, oh my God, is it how many letters are in the, uh, in this, uh, in this pasuk, in this sentence? And, and um, how, you know, they'll be listening to the cadence of the words, which I think is very important. And then well, Debbie, I, I do appreciate it. I would say Debbie's asking, when's the book yes. coming out? I did write a book on the Amida that's a, a couple chapters away from being done. It is going to be published probably within the next year. Uh, so just get on to hadar.org and you can sign up for our email or just poke around there. And I'm also going to publish it uh, onto Safari. So if you don't want to have it in the old fashioned book book way, you'll be able to access it online uh, as well. And that, that should be coming out within the next year. And I also believe that you have like lectures up on Hadar. I'll share people where you're talking about the prayer. So there's a Correct. lot of resources there as well. And I think Hadar has a great section about if you're leading services, it gives you resources. So you guys are a one-stop shop. We thank you for everything you've achieved in starting Hadar. And thank you for being with us for this whole month. You, I think you, you, part, you personally have done the most of any of the lectures. So this is your fifth program with us out of 18 so it's an honor to be with you thank you all for all your time and attention it's really great thank you everybody take care be well be safe and um enjoy davening the shabbos if you're at cbi don't forget to come if you can or participate because we're interviewing a rabbi for our show so see you there bye everybody